let's talk about Jesus, the King of kings, says he, the Lord of lords supreme, throughout eternity, the great I Sorry, I got caught visiting. I got caught visiting, and uh, I'm just so, I don't know, i just I'm so happy to be back in church. I, I don't know, I love, yeah, amen, thank you. Wayne and Cindy, good to have you back again uh, here with us and worshiping together. And uh, we just trust you will experience the blessing of the Lord as we share together. We're going to uh, just worship together and praise the Lord. I love the sense of fellowship that we have here, I really do. I truly do, and uh, and I love the fact that we can declare with faith that uh, uh, of who Jesus is. All right, let's stand together as we begin to worship together, and uh, with a sense of the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we praise you. We worship you this morning, and we trust in you and you alone. And we thank you, Jesus, that you died for us that we could have eternal life. Thank you for the assurance you bring by the presence and ministry of your Holy Spirit. And that there is one day, a day in which we will meet you, we will see you, we will worship you. But in the meantime, Lord, we just are getting ready for that day in praising you and declaring how you are worthy of all honor and glory and praise. And we just worship you today, Jesus. Amen. Let's sing this song together. A new name written down in glory. I was once a sinner, but I came parted to receive from my Lord. It was freely given, and I found that he always kept his word. There's 
a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes, it's mine, with my sins forgiven. God. Praise God. It'll be a wonderful day when we get to heaven, but you know what? We still have lots to do here while we're here. Lots of folks to be able to share the love of Christ with and uh, be salt and light in, in our world and to lift up Jesus Christ. Jesus said when he is lifted up, he will draw everybody to himself. I see, think, well, why don't they then? You know, there's, there's one man... He was talking to a minister. The Bible can't be true. Why is that? Because Jesus said when he's lifted up, he'll draw everybody to himself. And he pointed to a sign that was sticking out the front of the building. And the sign was up on a bracket bolted to the building. And he said, well, is gravity true? Well, of course it is. Well, how come that sign doesn't fall down to the ground? Well, he says, because it's bolted to the wall. He says, exactly. Some people are bolted against being drawn to Christ, he said. Oh, he said, don't, don't discount the fact, hey? But there's often things that hold people back that say no, 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 when deep inside their heart. But we just need to love on people, just love on people, and lift Jesus up. Let's sing this song, Above All. Above all powers, above all kings,
to go to that point for each one of us. We praise you and thank you. You may be seated, please. I want to do one more song as we focus on communion today uh, after the message. Uh, This is a song we learned last week that some of you are maybe familiar with. Worthy is the Lamb. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid, bearing all my sin and shame. In love you came and gave amazing grace. Let's try this song again together. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid, bearing all my sin and shame. For who he is. Can we get the, get you the mic and just yeah, let us just grab that mic for uh, we have that mic here just in case somebody does want to offer a testimony or praise note or prayer request so the folks outside can hear and also as it's recorded we can uh, include that. Go ahead. Well. There might be a shout on. I don't might not need this microphone. <laughs> but I, I'm so thankful for worthy is the Lamb. Mm. And he sought me when I was far from God. But he doesn't just leave me, but he draws me unto himself. Solomon said, draw me, and I will run after you. Mm. And you know, and you know that we lost our son-in-law October the 12th. 42 years of age, not 43 until 15 days later. But I've been asking the Lord, I want my life to tell for him that when I pass on, and I'm not trying to be funny. I like to clown around, but I'm not trying to be funny. But if anybody wanted to come to my funeral, don't wear black. Wear pink, wear bright colors, yellow, I don't care. And don't bring flowers, bring balloons, because it's a celebration of glory of God in my life. And I want to hold fast to that. Like I say, I'm not trying to be funny. But Lord, help me to line up so close to the word of God. There's a song that says, I want to be so close to him that it's no big change. There wouldn't be nothing much different because we are so close to Christ. And we're not above anybody else. And I pray that people say, oh, you pray, you get this, you get that. I'm not above anybody else, but I know who I have believed and persuaded he's able to keep that, which I've committed unto him against that day. I guess, Pastor, you're the one supposed to be preaching. (laughs) (laughs) Praise the Lord. Wayne, did you have something you wanted to share with us this morning? The Lord is so good. You know, as we were singing, 
these songs, especially the first one. As much we can rejoice in as children of God because of his goodness and his grace and his mercy and his love. But the greatest thing is that we've been brought into relationship with the Father mm. through Jesus Christ, the Son. Yes. And we rejoice in that. Amen. But I also want to give him thanks that he's been my strength and my helper. Mm. The last couple of months since my mom died. As the oldest son and, and power of attorney for my dad uh, left me with an awful lot to do. And uh, it's been very demanding physically and emotionally. And, mm. But uh, you know, we're pretty much through all that at this point. But I'd like you to continue to pray for us. And for my father, mm. we think he has Alzheimer's, and he was staying with my one daughter down in Woodstock, and his care for himself and so on is at the point where she said she basically can't do it anymore. Mm. So it looks like we'll probably be taking him. As you know, my wife had about 35 years in long-term care as a registered nurse and knows how to care for people like that, but uh, it's still physically demanding. No, no question, yeah. And so we continue to need the Lord's strength and help, yeah. and he has promised to be all that and more, mm. exceedingly above all that we can ask or think we have in him. So I just want to give him praise in the midst of, of requests. Let our requests be made known with thanksgiving Amen. and praise unto Amen. him. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise God. Firstly, I guess it's not very nice for Melissa and I to wear the exact same thing today. I'm Melanie. <laughs> That wasn't planned, was it? Uh, it was. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, it's been kind of weird since Brian died. Um, this is your brother-in-law. Yeah, yeah, my brother-in-law. Oh, I told myself I wasn't going to cry. It's weird because... I know we've been talking about it a lot, but the grief process is the grief process. Yes, it is. And it's weird because, like, you have to learn to live without someone. Mm -hmm. But the Lord has been gracious. Um, I found myself kind of asking him, this isn't anything to me, okay, but like kind of having conversations with God about being an empathetic person and how difficult that can be sometimes. Mm. Because I feel everything. <laughs> and I feel it for other people. Yes. So I almost feel like I don't have the right to still be so upset. Mm. But I know how it affects my family and the people around yes. me. Yes. And so I'm thankful because if that empathy is what makes me who I am so that I can reach the people around me, That's right. then it's not a curse, it's a blessing. That's right. That's right. Even though it's really hard. Mm -hmm. Because I'm not making it up, I feel everything for other people. And I've had some experiences at work where it can be very draining. Mm. But the Lord has helped me understand, and I know I've touched this on this before, 
that I'm so thankful my salvation is not dependent on my emotions. Because I know, I know so much more than I used to. Yes. And I still need to learn so much more. Yes. But the Lord has been teaching me, Mel, yeah, you know what? You don't, you don't feel this. Or just the struggles of emotions in general. <laughs> and it just kind of got me thinking about Remembrance Day and how mm. people are so... It's funny how religious people can be, how non-religious people can, can be, be religious, religious yes. around Remembrance Day. Yeah. You know, because they have strong feelings of when you can decorate your Christmas tree or what you should do to celebrate. And as I was driving home last night, it doesn't seem like the right segue, but it is because I'm thinking, I'm like, if they only knew the sacrifice that Jesus made for them yes. goes so far beyond any sacrifice any man yes. has ever made. Yes. And if they would only put that, even that little bit of conviction into what Jesus has done, how much, how much different things would be. Mm -hmm. So I found myself, just with all the emotions and everything, the Lord reminding me that no matter what happens around us, Jesus and that's kind of been that's my thing that's lately. It. Jesus. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Grab the mic, Paul. Um, first of all, I was going to say, don't ever, I remember my grandmother saying, don't ever apologize for tears. Nope. It's been a couple of weeks, I said to my wife, I said, since I've actually been able to cry. I said, and I always think of that uh, movie, uh, God's Not Dead. Yeah. What was the clip in, the, in there that said, uh, oh, I just lost it. Oh, it'll, it'll come. But uh, I'm thankful for everyone here today. Um, I'm glad I'm a Christian. Amen. Glad I'm on my way to heaven. Amen. Glad to hear the the testimonies today. Yeah. And uh, that's that's what I was going to say. I said to my wife, I said, I wish I could cry. There's this, just something. I don't know. June, I went through everything, both of us. You can cry then, but you can't cry now. And I'm like, man, just. But I'm about to. <laughs> uh, but I'm glad to hear the testimonies of the brother here. Feels good in here. Yeah. Glad he died on the cross for mm -hmm. our sins. Amen. I don't want to take up a lot of time. We just felt I should just share something. Mm. And it does feel good to cry. Finally. That was it. I remember the clip now. It said in the movie, when it's test time, the teacher's quiet. And I thought, what am I going through? Uh. For you to be that quiet, Lord. When it's test time, the teacher is quiet. It's quiet. Mm. <laughs> anyway, it's good to be here. Interesting. Glad for all of you. Praise the Lord. Today. Praise the Lord. Keep looking up. There's two things that are going through my mind. There's a song that says, tears are a language God understands. And secondly, sometimes, I don't know who said this. It was years ago. Somebody said it and it just kind of lodged in my brain. Sometimes... God allows us to cry to wash our eyes clear that we can see better. Sometimes he uses tears to do that. God made emotions too, folks. Okay? So let's not try to shove those away or whatever. It's all right. It's all right. And uh, we need to continue to remember what he has done for us. Yeah, you can go sit down. Um,
as part of his image. Yes. yes. Yeah. Emotions. Absolutely. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Yeah. Praise God. Praise God. Um, a couple of announcements. Um, uh, yeah. All right. Um, oh, I was going to mention about our communion table. It is open to anybody who confesses Jesus Christ as Lord and uh, seeks their forgiveness through him, his shed blood on the cross. So you don't have to be a member or regular attender of this church to receive communion. And we'll serve that later. And when you receive the cup or the bread, just hang on to it and we'll take it together. All right. Um, I, I recently, I've been made aware uh, of two scenarios where Christian preachers have said something about obeying the government in relation to the uh, COVID flu and all the mandates of the past three years. And one was a preacher from a church in the Belleville area, and another was a preacher online whom I personally watched as he said that you cannot be a good Christian unless you obey the government. You cannot call yourself a Christian and disobey anything the government tells you to do. And they were referring to both the mask mandates and the so-called vaccines. And this morning I want to address this issue of obeying the government because it has huge ramifications for living life as we move further and further away from any semblance of a Christian society. Now make no mistake, Christians, evangelical Christians especially you and I, are seen by most of the upper echelons of modern society as the enemy. We are the enemy of so-called progress. Why? Because we won't follow the science, right? Science is on the pedestal above everything else, and faith, uh uh-uh, has nothing to do with it. But, of course, we are in opposition to that. I believe it is mainly because... We will not follow the extreme small L liberal ideology. I believe that we as uh, we Christians are considered enemies of society because we stubbornly hold to the belief that God is the creator of all things and that we are answerable to him for what we do and how we live. We stubbornly refuse to accept that we evolved out of some chemicals in a primordial soup and our species of mammals evolved from apes. Uh, By the way, the scientist who declared that we share 95 to 98 percent of our DNA with chimpanzees, he restated the truth scientifically that we only share about 85 percent. We actually share more than 90 percent of DNA with pigs. Hmm. I wanted to say something out loud, but I better not. Anyway. Um. You might be interested to know that this same scientist who first declared we shared 95 to 98% with chimpanzees, but now it's only about 85%, he's a vocal creationist now. Also, we Christians are close to the top of the list of public enemies because we stubbornly hold to the belief that there are moral absolutes. There is definitely right and wrong, good and evil. We hold to absolutes like all life is sacred, from conception to natural death. Did you know that we're the only Western country in the world to have no laws protecting unborn children right up to the moment of birth? A child can be aborted five minutes before birth in this country, legally. And yet, if you destroy an eagle's egg, you can spend five years in jail or be fined $5,000 if you destroy an eagle egg. How did we get here? Also, are you aware that starting in January, we will be the only country in the world that will make it law that a doctor has to provide lethal injection to a mental health patient who says they don't want to live anymore, including children, those under 18. Did you know that? Aren't we proud of that? The only country in the world where lethal injection has to be provided to a mental health patient who says they don't want to live anymore. We Christians are on the government's list of enemies because we believe in absolutes. Absolutes like God created male and female. We refuse to accept that there are a myriad of choices. Is it seven or 17 genders we're up to now? I'm just not sure. We can live and let live as Christians, but don't force those choices on me or my children or my grandchildren. 
don't tell me I am intolerant if I don't believe exactly what you believe. That is the very definition of intolerance. Do we have that screen? Intolerance, an unwillingness or refusal to tolerate or respect contrary opinions or beliefs. Who's the intolerant one now? That this is the kind of governance we are under and is gaining influence over our individual lives. And the kind of governance that people are pointing to saying we must obey or we cannot be good Christians. Where do we read this in the Bible? Well, some people point to Romans 13 verse 1. This is in the New American Standard Bible. It says there, Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. I personally see great danger in interpreting Romans 13 to say that you cannot be a true Christian and disobey anything the government tells you to do. Humanity went down this road before in the 1930s and 40s. Before we take a close look at what the Bible has to say about obedience to the government, let me say that although Adolf Hitler hated the Bible, he really did, and he hated Christians, actually, he didn't mind sort of mainline Christians. He, he, he really hated conservative Christians. He did really, even though he hated the Bible and hated Christians, he loved Romans 13 verses 1 to 3. And he really liked how the mainline churches in Germany interpreted it. In July of 1933, during Hitler's first summer in power, a young German pastor named Joachim uh, Hassenfelder preached a sermon using the words of Romans 13 to remind worshipers of the importance of obedience to those in authority. The church was festooned with Nazi banners and stormtrooper flags. Its pews packed with Nazi party faithful, including men in the brown shirts of the Nazis' paramilitary movement. Did you know that during World War II, almost every church in Germany put swastika flags over every cross? There would be a swastika flag over this cross so you couldn't see the cross. Every church, almost, not in the conservative evangelical churches. We recoil at the thought of it now in our day. But German Christians understood that they simply had to obey the government, based on Romans 13. Boris Bergen, a professor of Holocaust studies at the University of Toronto, says that there was never a need to exhort Germans to be obedient to the regime because it never occurred to most of them to do otherwise. Woven into the very fabric of the German Christian belief was the idea that state rule was supreme and not to be questioned. It was the Nazis that referred to the Jewish question and the final solution, which saw six million Jews exterminated. So then, does Romans 13 mean that people like my grandparents and my mother and thousands of others who resisted the governing authorities by hiding Jews and young Dutch men like my father, that they're condemned by God? I mean, let, let me reread the passage from Romans 13, verses 1 and 2 this time. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. As we try to wrap our heads around that, let me add that the Bible never, underline that caps, bold, never contradicts itself. Okay? Oh, there may be apparent contradictions, things that on the surface appear as a contradiction. And what I mean is this. On the one hand, we have Romans 13, verses 1 to 5, which we'll look at the rest of those verses in a little while, that talks about being in subjection to governing authorities and not resisting them. And on the other hand, we have multiple passages in both the Old Testament and the New Testament of people actively resisting and disobeying the governing authorities. Like in Exodus chapter 1, where a new pharaoh, afraid of how numerous the Hebrews were getting, commanded the midwives to murder every newborn boy in verse 17. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt had commanded them, but let the boys live. 
The king demand, uh, then demanded to know why, and the midwives lied about what was happening. They lied. The king said, when the woman is on the birthing stool and you're delivering that baby, kill it. And they said, oh, king, the Hebrew women are so much more robust than the Egyptian women because by the time we get there, the baby's born and it's gone. We don't know where it went. They lied. They helped deliver the baby, but they lied to Pharaoh. Did God bring condemnation down on them for disobeying? Verse 20 and 21. So God was good to the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very mighty. Because the midwives feared God, he established households for them. Hmm. And what about the three friends of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who refused to bow down to the golden image of King Nebuchadnezzar, as we find in Daniel 3? You see, King Nebuchadnezzar threatens to throw them into the furnace if they continue to refuse. Everybody else, can you imagine tens of thousands of people all bowing down and three guys standing up? You kind of stick out like a sore thumb, don't you? You really do. There's no kind of, oh, we're just going to go hide sideways behind this tree. No, no, no. They're in the middle of the tens of thousands and everybody's bowing down to this golden statue that's, I don't know, 30 feet high or something like that. And they're standing there. they answered to the king, we've already made up our minds. Our God is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, but even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods, gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Blatant resistance, direct disobedience of a governing authority. Did God condemn them? No. He delivered them through the fire. They didn't even smell like smoke, the Bible says. Isn't that cool? Ha. One more example from the past, this time from the New Testament, the life of Peter and John in Acts. They were going to the temple to pray, and a lame man, a man who couldn't walk, was begging and asking them for money. And Peter turned to him and said, I do not possess silver or gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ and Nazarene, walk. And he did. Everyone was amazed, but Peter started telling them that it was because of Jesus who they had put to death, but whom God had raised from the dead that this man could walk again. The religious leaders, hearing that Peter and John were preaching about Jesus as Messiah and blaming them for the death of Jesus, hauled them in for questioning. Acts chapter 4. When they had summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Here's a governing authority laying down the law. Verse 19, but Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking about what we've seen and heard. When they had threatened them further, they let them go. And sometime later, Peter and John and the others were in the temple precincts, again, healing people and preaching Jesus. And the high priest and his buddies, the governing authorities, I mean, they are irate. And they have brought in again to face trial. We pick it up in Acts chapter 5, verse 27. When they had brought them, they stood them before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in his name. And yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. Not just active resistance, but outright disobedience of a governing authority. Is the Bible contradicting itself in Romans 13? Let me keep going with both the testimony of Jesus and the testimony of angels regarding believers and a future time. This was just past, okay? This was back in the past, Old Testament, New Testament, history. I want to take you to two things in the future where we're talking about resistance and disobedience to the governing authorities. In Matthew 24, don't put it up just yet. Jesus is talking to his disciples and us about what things will be like just before his return in the end of the age. After describing things that line up with the four horsemen of Revelation chapter 6 and the breaking of the seals of the scroll, Jesus says this in Matthew 24 verse 21. For then there will be a great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. 
Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then, if anyone, that can indicate someone of importance or an authority, says to you, behold, here is the Christ. Or, there he is, do not believe him. Basically, Jesus is saying it will be a trap to capture and kill all Christians who are eagerly waiting Christ's return. They will be deceived into thinking that Jesus did return, but somehow they missed it. And Jesus goes on to say in verse 24, For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told you in advance. So if they... The people in charge, the governing authorities, say to you, Behold, he's in the wilderness. Do not go out. Or, Behold, he's in the inner rooms. Do not believe them. Jesus is advocating direct disobedience of governing authorities in the end days. And what about the instructions of angels about the end times? For this, we go to the book of Revelation. In Revelation 13, God tells us that near the uh, end, a one-world government will set up a system whereby you can only buy or sell if you obey Satan and the Antichrist's economic policy and receive what is known as the mark of the beast, most likely a microchip implanted uh, just under the skin on your hand or, as the Bible says, under your forehead, without which you will not be able to buy or sell anything. Now, before all this happens, before the mark of the beast is instituted, we are told this in chapter 14, verses 9 to 12. Can you put those up, Josh, please? Then another angel, a third one, followed them, the first two, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives the mark on, interestingly, that Greek word on can also be translated in, But original translators didn't understand how something could be in the skin. They only understood what could be on the skin. But that word can be translated two different ways, depending on the context. So if anyone receives the mark in his forehead or in his hand, he will also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night. Those who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Verse 12. Here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. So listen carefully. Anybody who obeys the governing authorities, and gets the mark, will be automatically condemned and will forfeit any chance of eternal life. They they will suffer in hell forever and ever. But, but, those Christians who refuse to take the mark, those Christians who refuse this order by the governing authorities of the day, rather than being condemned by God, as Romans 13 says, are called those who persevere in obedience to God and faith in Jesus. So, with all these examples of both the Old Testament and New Testament, the actions of the people in the past, and the testimony of Jesus and angels about the future, it is clear that disobedience of government officials is not what Romans 13 is talking about. It can't be, because Scripture never contradicts itself. So now where do we go? Well, back to Romans 13. Again, I'm going to read through from verses 1 through a few more verses. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Verse 2. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. Now, we've already seen that was not the case for the Hebrew midwives, for Daniel's three friends, even for Daniel, remember? Hey, the king said, nobody's going to pray to anybody but me for 30 days. And Daniel opens the shutters of his window, kneels down in front, and starts praying to God. He knows. He gets thrown in the, the lion's den. Direct disobedience. But then there's also Peter and John. And, and it won't be condemnation for us in the future if we're still here and we refuse the mark. Then verse 3. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Is that always true of governments? No. When we think of our own democratic society, yeah, maybe, but not governments all around the world. 
Second half of verse 3. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good and you will have praise from the same, for it is a minister of God to you for good. Has that always been true of governments? Ah, uh, rarely. Special interest groups, powerful lobbies, or the very wealthy get rewarded. And sometimes they are very much on the side of evil or selfishness rather than the good. Let's keep going. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it, the authority, does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger, who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Has that always been true of governments? No way. Down through the years, biblical scholars have argued that this passage is telling us we must obey the government. But the same scholars who say that say that when a government is corrupt or punishes people for doing good and rewards people for doing evil or perpetuates that evil themselves like the Nazis, then we can and must resist and disobey. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? On the one hand, they say, well, this passage is about governments and you have to obey them, but if if they turn bad, well, then you can resist and disobey. The same scholars argue both sides of the coin. But Paul doesn't give us that allowance. That latitude, if he's talking about civil authorities and political governments. Back to Paul's letter in Romans 13.1. This time in the literal Greek, it says this. Let every soul be subject to the authorities being above him. That's the literal Greek. The word government or governing isn't in there. Paul is talking about Christians in the church. You see, the word authority in the Greek is exousia, delegated power. And it refers to the authority God gives to his saints, authorizing them to act to the extent they are guided by faith, God's revealed word. In early Christian society, there was a clear system of delegated power or authority. As Paul says in Ephesians 4.11, God gave some as apostles, some as prophets, and some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers. We also know the church had set up elders within the governance of the church as well. Let me keep going. Romans 13, verse 3, in the literal Greek. For the rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. And rulers in the Greek is archson, leading men. Within the Jewish culture, an official member of the assembly of elders. Now let's see how this connects with what Paul says earlier. And I want you to keep in mind the fact that chapter and verse divisions were not what Paul wrote. They came some 1,200 to 1,500 years later. Okay? So we need to remember, we, sometimes we forget when we hit a chapter, the end of one chapter and start a number, we get thinking, oh, he's starting a new thought. This is disconnected from what went before. But that's not the way we're supposed to read the Scriptures. It's not like he's stopping one thought and starting another 13 verse 1. So let's back up into what we call chapter 12 at verse 4. For just as we have many members in one body and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. And here's how we are to act as the body of Christ, Paul is saying. And he continues, verse 6. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith. If service, in his serving. Or he who teaches, in his teaching. Or he who exhorts, in his exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. If we remember back in Romans 13, verse 3, for the rulers, he says, are there for your good. Rulers are leading men. He who leads. The Greek there is proistemi. I rule over, pre-standing. It's referring to a preset or well-established character which provides the needed model to direct and rule over others. Paul says, he who leads, do it with diligence. Diligence to take the lead. It underlines the effectiveness of influencing people by having a respected reputation. I, that is, one that is built on a solid track record. And this happens by setting the example of excellence, by living in faith. So we have Paul's injunction. Romans 13, verse 1. Every person is to be in subjection to the authorities. But the word governing is not in there. Government isn't in there. It's not in the original Greek, but instead inserted by translators. And then we have verse 3. 
Those who lead are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Within the church, there are those who lead and mete out God's justice against evil. Follow me on this. We have an example of this from 1 Corinthians 5, where Paul writes this. It is actually reported there is immorality among you, and immorality of such a kind as does not even exist among the Gentiles. That someone has his father's wife, that's his stepmother, as his sex partner. You have become arrogant and have not mourned instead so that the one who has done this deed would be removed from your midst. Okay, here he goes on. Let me drop down to verse 11. I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother, that is fellow Christian, if he is an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one, remove the wicked man from among yourselves. That's why Paul wrote in Romans 13, verses 4 and 5. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it, the authority, does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. Paul is telling us this is how the body of Christ is to operate under authority. Under godly authority within the body. Does it mean then we don't have to obey the government? Woohoo! All right. Uh, not so fast. Slow down a little bit. Yeah, Augustus, you got her. Yeah. We need to go to 1 Peter chapter 2. In how we learn how do we deal with the government. First Peter 2. Do we have that up there already? Good. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Whether to as a, a king as the one in authority. Or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers. And the praise of those who do right. Can you pop up verse um, 13 again please? Can you go back to verse 13? In Romans? No, 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 no. In Second Peter, in First Peter chapter 2. The, the one verse just before. Yeah. Peter says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority, in the next verse, or to governors. This is the same Peter who told the governing authorities, No, we won't stop preaching Jesus. It's the same guy. So what's he at? Where's he going with this? Submit yourselves. Here it is. For the Lord's sake. In the Greek it means through. Submit yourselves through the Lord. Or on account of the Lord. To every human institution. What if a king or a governor commands you to do something that's immoral or illegal. Or something that goes directly against the will of God. Or his law to love him with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. And your neighbor as yourself. We do not obey such orders. What did Peter say? We must obey God rather than men. And my grandfather, who helped hide 2,500 people in his hometown, half of them Jews, he said, whenever law of man fell below the law of God, we obey the law of God. Period. I like that. That is is what makes sense to me. And that is what Peter is advocating here. Our first obedience is to and through the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter goes on to say, verse 15, For such is the will of God that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. By doing right. Even if that means disobeying the government that's telling you to do something that's wrong. You just do right. Verse 16, he's trying to help us understand where our limits are. Act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. What Peter is saying is that you can't disobey the government and say, well, I'm free under Christ if you are trying to do something that is evil. Something that is against the law of love. You can't go, well, I'm free under Christ. I'm, I'm, you know. No, 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 no. If you're trying to do something that's wrong, you don't get away with that. But, as Peter says, you are God's bond slaves. I like that word. Bond slave means believers who willingly live under Christ's authority 
as his devoted followers. You are to obey him first and most of all, even if, even when that means disobeying the government, especially when doing the right thing goes against an edict of an earthly government, as we saw Peter and John do. Paul says to us that we our citizenship is in heaven. He's essentially saying that our first and highest responsibility is to God and Jesus our King and to fulfill the law of love because, as in Romans 13 a little later, it says, He who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. So, love God, love each other, and keep being the church. Let's pray. Father, you packed a lot of stuff into our brains this morning. Help us. Help us by the power and ministry and light of your Holy Spirit to be able to not just absorb this into our heads, but to understand that, Father, you are the highest authority in our lives. Jesus, you are king above all else. And help us to continue to walk in the light as you are in the light and we can have fellowship with one another. Praise you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me as we sing our song before the throne of God above and we prepare ourselves for receiving communion as well. Before the throne of God above I have a strong seated please stand to sing the last verse of Calvary covers it all how blessed the thought that my soul by him bought shall be his in the glory on high where with gladness and song I'll 
down pretty simple, doesn't it? Hey, I've said it before already this morning. I'll say it again. Love God, love each other, and then go out there and be the church. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen.